Hi, welcome to this, or the first episode this week of um, Golden Path to Spring One. Uh, so basically, if you haven't heard of Spring One, it's a conference that we have um, for spring folks. Um, it's going to be happening in person this year in Vegas um, in August. So there'll be a little screen at the very end of this to tell you a little bit more about that. Uh, CFP is still open for a few more days. Um, so submit stuff to that and to have VMware Explorer. Um, so yeah, uh, thanks everyone for coming. If you haven't been to any of these before, we have them pretty much every single Tuesday and Thursday. So come join us. If you uh, want to see some of the previous episodes, you can just go to tanzu.tv and there'll be things for gold, under Golden Path and then there's a bunch of other stuff. All of the videos for them, including today's, will be up on uh, a few YouTubes and also on Twitch as well. Um, so yeah, today um, we have Jean and Vinay, and they'll be there from um, Cobalt Music, and we'll be giving a talk on tuning the streams for music artists. Uh, could you uh, tell me a little bit about yourselves? Uh, sure. Uh, hi. Uh, so my name is Joao. Uh, I've been with Cobalt for three and a half years, more or less. My background is software engineering. Uh, I mostly worked with the Java ecosystem over the years. And for the past maybe five years, I've been a manager. So I'm an engineering manager currently at Cobalt. Hi, uh, I'm Vinay. Uh, I've been working with Cobol for almost the same time as um, Joe as well. Uh, my background is uh, um, uh, Java engineering, and I'm working in a capacity of technical architect at um, Cobol at the moment. Awesome, cool. Yeah, so I'm excited to hear about this. I love music. It is uh, <laughs> I don't know how I would uh, like go through my days without music in some capacity. So yeah, um, let me share your slides. Oh, and one other thing, I was just told that the uh, CFP for uh, the conference is extended until mid-April, so still get it in ASAP. Cool. All right, I guess we can take it away. So hi again, thanks for joining. Uh, so today we'd like to talk a little bit about uh, Cobalt, our company, uh, a little bit about the music industry as well and how it operates on a very high level. Uh, speaking a little bit about our history with technology, uh, and then uh, I'll hand over to my colleague Vinay, who will do a deep dive uh, on royalty processing specifically and what we've been doing around that space in terms of replatforming, uh, and also how Spring has been helping us uh, do that. Uh, so, just talking a little bit about Cobalt. Um, I believe Cobalt Music is not very well known uh, at, in compar when compared to the majors like Warner and Universal, and Universal but uh, we actually operate more or less on the same level. Uh, we share a very similar market share. Uh, and I think you can see from the brief sample of our artist roster that we also manage some pretty big names. Uh, this is just a very small uh, uh, preview, uh, but uh, in essence, we have a really, really rich uh, and, and high visibility catalog. Um, and uh, when it comes to the music industry and how we operate in it, uh, very briefly, because uh, the industry is actually quite complex and depending on what you do, things can vary wildly. But uh, uh, in essence, you have two flows of uh, information. You have the production of music uh, and then making sure that that music is available for consumers. Uh, so you can see that in one direction from bottom to top here. Uh, and then you have a second direction, which is whenever music is consumed, there is royalty data pursue, uh, uh, produced uh, uh, normally. And then uh, we, ha we have to ingest that royalty data. Uh, we have to receive money and then understand who should be paying, who should be paid, how much they should be paid, et cetera. Um, so uh, Cobalt's uh, mission uh, here is actually... Uh, trying to make this space uh, a little bit fairer, more fair for, for artists. And what we try to do this is try to make things uh, as transparent as possible uh, and also as fast as possible because this flow of information sometimes can take a long time. Specifically, when we're talking about payments, uh, it can take a long time for artists to get paid. And also it can be really hard for them to understand where the money is coming from. Uh, and this can be really valuable information. Uh, if you think uh, of an artist planning like a tour or where they want to launch the next album, et cetera, that sort of thing. Um, 
I think it's also clear that uh, this is a very, uh, again, it's a very simplified version that can be uh, a view. There can be a lot of layers in between producers, artists, and consumers. Uh, and so it can be really challenging to operate in this space. Um, uh, there is also industry-wide a problem of poor data flowing through these different layers. There's lacks of standards and things like that. And what happens is that a lot of the times uh, the information uh, gets misinterpreted uh, or just gets lost. Uh, and ultimately, this really can have an impact uh, on the artist specifically because we can be missing on money that they should that they are owed uh, and things like that, uh, which in today's day and age, it's, 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 it's a really poor uh, place to be in, uh, really. Uh, so uh, specifically about Cobalt and how we try to improve the space, uh, we have two main business units at the moment. Uh, we have AMRA, uh, which is there uh, on the diagram, which is a collection society. And then we have a music publishing uh, business unit, which is the Red K there. Uh, so obviously by occupying more than one layer, we try to take advantage of this and try to make sure that the information uh, in-house flows as fast as possible as well. And we can take as much uh, advantage as possible from all the information that we're producing in-house. Um, I think this is it for a brief overview of the industry. Uh, for the purposes of this presentation and what Vinay will be uh, deep diving more, uh, we're going to be focusing on the downward flow of information. So whenever music gets consumed and royalty information is produced, what is happening uh, on our side uh, in order to make sure that artists are paid? So how are we ingesting and processing that royalty data? Um, and just to cover a little bit of our tech history uh, before uh, we dive into uh, the current platform. Uh, so Cobalt is not a new company. It exists for 20 plus years. And like most companies, uh, we've started with a monolithic system. Uh, basically, that monolithic system was made of this big Oracle database. Uh, and we have traditionally a Java Swing UI application on top. Uh, which is very much still in use for day-to-day -day business operations, uh, so used inter internally mostly as a back-office application. Uh, and we also have externally facing a portal and uh, mobile applications that the artists can in interact with. Um, as traditionally, uh, this type of system requires a lot of manual testing. Uh, uh, in our case specifically, we have a lot of logic in Oracle, for example, in the form of PL SQL, which makes it really hard to have automated testing. So this leads to uh, very long release cycles as well. Uh, and then with all the downsides that you get uh, over time when, as things start to grow and grow. So today it's really hard to maintain this system. Uh, it's also really hard to hire or attract the right type of talent because we're dealing with all technologies here. Uh, and also the fact that we have so much uh, dependency on one single database for so many critical uh, operations, uh, it means that things can go wrong really quickly because you introduce a bug uh, or some bad deployment and then you can bring the whole thing down and that can just have a devastating impact to the, uh, to the wider business. Uh, specifically in our case of royalty processing uh, that we're going to talk here, uh, we've also hit uh, some really hard limits uh, a few years ago, for example. In 2018, we processed around 1 billion royalties. Uh, in 2020, it was around 2 billion royalties. Uh, this was a 100% increase in a couple of years. Uh, and I think it was around 2019 that this Oracle system, Oracle database started to struggle uh, with the royalty volume and the time we had to process all of it. Um, today, luckily, we are in a much better position uh, due to the effort of uh, lots of the teams uh, in our engineering departments that, uh, and the work they've been doing for the last couple of years. Uh, we're still depending on the Oracle system to a certain extent, uh, but uh, we have successfully replaced some of these critical components uh, to a newer tech stack, royalty processing being one. And for example, we can say that today we process around 80% of our royalties in our new pipeline uh, that runs uh, in a different infrastructure. We use AWS mostly for it. Uh, we also can do this processing a lot faster. Before we had around 400 royalties per second on this Oracle database. Today we can hit uh, 4,000 and we think that's not really hard limits. Uh, we can scale more if we need. Uh, so this is really good, not just to cope with the immediate pressure, but also future proofing the business. Uh, for growth. Uh, and uh, another strategy that we've employed was to try to have, uh, in some areas at least, an event-driven architecture. Uh, because uh, to give you a concrete example, 
there's a lot of things that go into play when we process royalties. And one example, for example, is uh, we need to take into account the kind of contracts or agreements that artists have with us. Uh, and these agreements actually change a lot. Uh, and whenever th there's a change in a specific agreement, sometimes royalties need to be reprocessed to take into account the new rules. And uh, this used to um, have to be a manual process. It still is uh, in many ways. But uh, one idea that we have uh, for the future is that we can start having our new applications to react to these events. So whenever an agreement changes, we can immediately know which royalties need to be pre-processed and just do that uh, instead of waiting for any manual intervention. Um, so this is, uh, it's, it's a journey. We're not uh, finished by any stretch. But we've come a long way. Uh, and uh, I think another area that's really interesting uh, that we're starting to invest in is because of the bad information or the bad, the poor metadata that I've mentioned earlier that uh, exists across the industry uh, going through all these different layers. Uh, we're also starting to employ some new machine learning techniques to try to uh, recoup some of the missing information. And that's really promising because uh, it means that we are able to deliver more for our artists uh, than we could uh, normally could uh, when dealing with data uh, in the more traditional sense. Uh, and then obviously we have all the good engineering practices that come from uh, rebuilding uh, some of these components onto a new tech stack, like it's listed there. I'm not going to go over those, but uh, that's also a really good, uh, really good thing to, to to be able to achieve as part of this. Uh, so this this. Was it for a brief snapshot of uh, Cobalt Music, the industry, and a little bit of our history in terms of technology? Uh, now I'm going to hand over to my colleague Binay, who's going to walk you more specifically about the royalty processing side of things, and also the role that Spring has been playing uh, as part of this journey, essentially. Uh, thank you, Joe, and thank you, listeners, for joining us today for this talk. Uh, like Joe already mentioned, so we had this ancient system which has got lots of batch processes in place uh, for calculating the royalties. Um, obviously, we have this um, uh, three-tier system from two decades old where we got Swing UI and um, uh, talking to a Tomcat server and storing everything into the Oracle database, right? So. To take this monolith out into the cloud, we had kind of like we were looking at which places that will be more effective to take them out first because we're not uh, planning on taking the whole system built in two decades uh, over cloud all in one go, uh, not practical. So yeah, we decided the part that makes sense to go um, best was the royalty calculation area wherein we are receiving millions of royalties and um, we are generating billions of payments over there. If we take that process out into the cloud, we can free up a lot of space in Oracle database. Um, and um, that will give us a real boost to have um, make a good impact in terms of performances um, with uh, royalty calculation. So yeah, we went down the uh, canopy of having an event-driven architecture, so Kafka, uh, being our backbone to begin with and thinking of putting those processes as a microservices uh, which are interacting in a choreography way. Uh, so that once that system design was put in place, we needed next two ingredients. What does our microservices look like, uh, which is the first area? How do we, uh, what, what, what is the architecture of the services that we're going to build? Now, learning from our system, old systems, we have decided that we want to keep our application logic uh, far away from all the infrastructure uh, view. So um, uh, the one thing that we wanted to go down the route was making use of the explicit architecture, which, um, which is basically um, uh, uh, Herberto Gracia's um, piece of work, which is kind of like putting together understanding of all the architectures that we see on internet these days, the clean architecture, hexagonal architecture, port and adapter architecture, even driven command query. So that is his view. Um, there's a link shared on to the um, presentation, which gives you a further big reading about how all, how he sees all this thing put together in a certain way. And it made ultimate sense for us to kind of like have a clean architecture in place. So, we were inspired by that and we thought we would try to put um, a clean architecture into our microservices 
which basically on the next slide means uh, we have to separate out our um, application logic from the systems that are going to invoke our application logic and the systems that we'll be using to fulfill our purposes, which is basically the driving adapters, which are talking to our application logic. And then application logic needs some database, some queuing infrastructure to fulfill its requirements. So we would like to keep them completely separate from application logic. Uh, and our application logic should not be dependent on those two areas. Um, next, what we did was we, we decided about how are we going to structure our application logic. Um, so we broke them down into the domain uh, driven design where we have domain entities, we have domain services, and most of our use cases are developed using an application layer, which is sitting on top of those domain services and interacting with them. Uh, while interacting with things like queuing system, we also needed some command handler, which our driven adapters will be able to invoke. So we had command handlers and um, um, uh, query and event handlers, which will be invoking our use case in turn, which in turn will be talking to our domain services. So uh, the interesting part over there to look at is um, the driving adapter is naturally dependent on the application logic um, because it is calling the application logic. But the application logic is invoking the driven adapters, but we didn't want our application logic to be dependent on their code. So there was an inversion of dependency, as in like the driven adapters were injected um, into the application logic as and when they were being called. Um, so obviously that was the first ingredient about what the architecture of microservices look like. On the next slide, we have the second ingredient, which is basically what frameworks do we need? How can we leverage um, all the things that has already been done into the industry to kind of bring it, us, bring it to us and just focus on writing the application logic? So when we put these two things together on the next slide, uh, what we came up was uh, our template service. Our template service came up with um, lots of Spring Framework um, uh, uh, goodies, which were able to talk to our infrastructure. And because we were even driven, we didn't have much of, we don't as of yet have lots of user interactions with this new system that we are building. Uh, so users are still interacting with the legacy system, but we extract the data out of the legacy system using change data capture process. And uh, we start our process from that point on. So basically uh, what we have in place is Kafka as a backbone, which triggers our choreography of all this application so, uh, services that we have put together. And we also have mixtures of uh, databases to hold the state uh, of our events um, when they're passing through. And we also have notifications and alerts and observability, all the things that um, Spring provides out of the box. On the next slide, um, what does this, so we have this components. Um, so we have decided our architecture, we have decided our framework. So what does uh, our service looks like? This is the high level of, at the center of the diagram, you can see we have got an application core, which is made up of the domain services, domain entities uh, stuck together. Um, and they're just interacting with um, the domain related, um, uh, uh, domain related components. On the left and the right hand side, we've got event pass adapter, which is our driving adapter, um, uh, which is reading from our Kafka topics and invoking application logics. And on the right hand side, we have query and command adapters, which are basically uh, our driven adapter, which are giving us more rich information that is needed in order to serve the business um, and uh, store the state of our uh, domain entities into the databases. Um, on to the next slide, we go a little bit deeper into the control flow of how this is interacting using Spring components in place. So we are, we as a developer uh, in our team are focused purely on writing those green boxes, which is basically we just implement our application services, our domain services, which are made up of command functions, query functions, or the functions which are implementing our application services. But a lot of boilerplate code, a lot of, um, 
infrastructure related code is already been taken care of by the Spring framework. All we have to do is just configure the Spring framework in such a way that it gets to invoke our uh, functions um, um, and it takes care of lots of um, um, exception handling and those kind of things for us as well. So the typical flow on that diagram, if you see at number one, um, the Kafka client, uh, which is embedded into the Spring Cloud, um, uh, Spring Cloud Stream K Stream binder, is basically responsible for reading using the Kafka client, reading the input from the Kafka topic, um, deserializing that message if it is in some binary format, and then uh, using the consumer is passing or invoking the functions that we have written, which is when the whole process that uh, we have implemented starts picking up that particular data. And then eventually either we send the output uh, message, which is a valid message or an error message as in a business error message to the producer, which is then written back onto the output topic. Any of the deserialization errors or serialization errors are configured within Spring to be kind of like either lock them out or write them to DLQ. We don't have to write even a single line of code to do that. We just have to configure them into the application YAML property files. Um, so that's the beauty of um, uh, embedding Spring frameworks into our services, which makes writing our code much more focused and much more easier as a developer. On the next slide. So what does our service now looks like? So on a high level, this is what most of our service functions. So each of our services are, a, uh, are further broken down into the functions. A service can have multiple functions um, and those functions can be command, uh, can be implementing the command handler or can be implementing query handler, or they can be implementing the event handler. Uh, what does it look like? It takes in a stream of messages coming from the Kafka. Um, it goes through this um, command chain, which is basically the source, various processors within uh, the streaming, as in like filtering, aggregation, and eventually at some point in time after it has done the filtering and aggregation, those kind of things, it will invoke a particular piece of business logic, which is where the center of um, uh, the center of the function um, comes into the play. So we are using MapStruct to convert the binary formats into our entities. And then we are using Vever validation to identify the business entities uh, good enough to proceed. And then eventually we invoke our core functions, which are written into um, the application core area, like we saw previously, um, which then does what it needs to be doing in terms of business processing and returns back a domain entity, which is on its way back, just converted with the binary format and written back down into the Kafka topic. So these are typical, all the functions that we are writing implements exactly the same way. And on the next slide, it just um, shows that how readable the code becomes. This is one of our simple function uh, that we have implemented. Um, and we have got like hundreds of functions like this uh, at the moment, um, which are basically um, taking an Avro mapper on, on line 134, as you can see, it has got an Avro mapper. Uh, which is mapping the incoming message to the uh, entity. On the next line, it is then using the validator to validate all the uh, business rules are passing for that particular entity. And when it is good enough, it's invoking another function, which is basically the processor. This is where the business logic lies. So all our identified royalty processing mess, uh, uh, logic is in, in that identified royalty processor. And eventually, uh, when it returns an uh, output object, um, optionally, we also check um, the output entity is good enough to be uh, written out. Um, and then finally, it maps to the binary format and goes out. So yeah, all of our application logic is just kind of compositions of all these Java functions together. Uh, it becomes much more easier. On the next slide, um, Putting all of this together now, the scale of our infrastructure is quite big as in like, uh, just to give a quick example of uh, one of the song, um, uh, which has got a five writers and it includes nine musicians and it is recorded in 11 different um, versions and it has got eight official remixes. So you can see a one particular song 
can have that many artifacts and we are receiving royalties for each of those artifacts, right? For each official remix, um, we are receiving uh, a particular royalty. And that royalty then needs to be distributed among like nine musicians and five writers. And we are collecting them from hundreds of territories. And uh, if that song is played like 170 uh, million times uh, by 3.2 millions, all of a sudden you can realize that a, one particular song can generate millions of royalties um, and up to like millions of pounds that needs distributing among those 14 um, artists, five writers and the nine musicians. And we have a catalog of millions of such song. So it's, it's quite a huge scale of data that is coming through this. And the way we work this out is our legacy system sitting on the top um, is uh, kind of like we are extracting data out of that. And then we have this uh, various services implemented together. And as you can see in the middle, they're talking over the uh, message bus by passing the events to each other, um, which eventually then realizes the payments for us and sends it back to our legacy system. Um, and that's how we save a lot of um, data that we didn't have to write into the um, legacy system um, by processing them into the cloud. On the next slide, um, we have had some of the challenges, uh, like uh, conceptually it was quite right uh, to uh, adapt to the hexagonal architecture, but there is no right way of putting together. For example, do we package our core as a single jar file or we package our code as a, a single mono repo? All of those decisions uh, that need to be made as a team. Uh, it wasn't kind of like out of the box uh, uh, of how you structure your code. Um, you have to go through some experimentation to make it work for you. And we had our own rounds of experimentations with that and we got the balance right. And uh, after two or three attempts, we got our services uh, working correctly in the way that made sense to us. Um, uh, obviously, there were some architectural um, challenges that we faced. Uh, for example, um, writing to the database and writing to Kafka, uh, we cannot have, like traditionally we used to have two-phase commit protocols to kind of like ensure the um, atomicity between two distributed system, uh, which is not the cases with, um, um, with the Kafka in place. So we had to kind of like devise some sort of um, patterns um, based on uh, the transaction outbox or based on uh, CQRS um, or, or saga patterns to kind of like come to an eventual consistent state so that uh, we realize that the two systems where the data is stored are both in sync. Um, so yeah, we had those little bit of architectural challenges to deal with. Um, on Spring Framework level, we didn't have uh, many challenges over there other than a little bit of learning curve in the team in, in order to understand all the frameworks like Spring Cloud streams and how they work underneath and what kind of opinions that they've made on top of Kafka Streams uh, API or Kafka API, how are they using consumers and producers? A uh, little bit looking under the hood was required. But other than that, the only painful point was around the application YAML file, which has got various levels of binding, like Kafka string bindings. There is a, a Kafka binding, and then there is a function binding. And how the override between those bindings work was a bit um, confusing. But that was mostly prior to 2.6.0 versions of the Spring Boot. Post that point, it became a little bit clearer. But uh, we still have those multi-level binding, which sometimes confuses to the new developers. And uh, the last part we had challenge around was um, because of this asynchronous nature, um, testing the positive test cases as in like we've sent the message and we are expecting the message to arrive was good enough. But testing the negative, like if you are sending a wrong message, if the message is not good enough um, to ensure that it is not arriving onto the end topic, those kind of scenarios were taking a bit um, uh, longer to kind of like realize or getting a good guarantee that it actually hasn't happened because you have to kind of like have to put delays in your integration test, which then makes your integration test run much, much slower than you would have liked to, especially when you've got hundreds and hundreds of integration tests, test, everything is working fine across all the services. So 
yeah, those were the higher challenges, but there were also big wins from um, adopting to this architecture and you making use of those spring frameworks. The primary was um, the observability. Um, it gave us prior to this architecture, we didn't have much um, view into how things were going inside our batch processes, but with this event driven and uh, uh, microservices and each services being observable, we were able to kind of like use the actuator to our full best capacity to identify um, how the system is behaving. Um, and we were pushing lots of custom metrics to the data dog using the metrics um, framework provided by the Spring Boot, um, which gave us quite visibility into everything that was going. And adopting to a functional programming language gave us um, much more easier way to decompose our um, logics into smaller bits and we were able to test them out individually. Uh, the other good things were um, the spring documentation and the testing experience based on the test containers, availability and um, spring Boot test. Uh, it kind of like made, made our jobs much more easier, much more readable. We were able to write much more readable tests, which made a complete sense from uh, understanding what the test is testing. Uh, it didn't have lots of boilerplate code around consumers and producers, which will con convolute um, the testing logic. Um, though the documentation was quite there, like 80% of it was there, but when we needed some advanced help, the documentation was falling short for us. But we, during that time, we used to reach out to Stack Overflow and Gitter, and the Spring community was quite responsive. The amount of time we have put questions and the responses we have got is quite, quite is usually very quick. It's not even like next day. It's, sometimes it is even within an hour that you just get the response back. So it, 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 it was kind of like really great to kind of like have that support uh, from Spring community to do a really good job out of this. That's pretty much it. Back to you, Joel. Yeah, thanks, Vinay. Uh, I know I passed too quickly, but yeah, if you're interested, I guess you can go back on the presentation and just check our career sites uh, if you're ever interested in helping us on this journey. Awesome. Uh, thanks, you too. Um, this was, I, I like how it was like all the different parts, like the way you went about things and then like the, the wins at the end. Those are awesome. <laughs> Leave the good bits for the end. Switch it back to regular. There we go. Yeah, um, we didn't have any questions, but that is you like. I feel like it was a lot of um, being able to just like follow along of what was the pathway that you all were working on, which is, it's really cool seeing like these like stories of like, not just like, oh, here's a thing. How do you like, go do this, go do that. But like actually hearing a story of like, what people have specifically done themselves and it working out for them. Yeah. yeah. yeah I mean, it's, it's definitely an evolving process. But uh, yeah, like, like we try to highlight it is there's been a lot of ground covered already, which has been really good. Yeah, I yeah. mean, none of this stuff is what I would say easy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, it was not easy at all. But I think it was quite um, um, it was quite straightforward in terms of to achieve our goals because lots of things were already done and they were like put together. So yeah, it made the job really easy. But yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it, it like it makes it sound easier to the people who just get to listen and be like, oh, cool, you did these things and not having to actually be the person that's like, oh, I have to do this and this and this. Like the whole just like process of migration and everything in general is just like, it's not simple. Like, I mean, it, just like dealing with the talk of like going from uh, just like having Kubernetes to being able to do things in production. It's just like all these things that you may have to do or not do. And it's just all these things are a lot. And that's why engineers, yay. <laughs> I mean, and when you're dealing with such a big uh, legacy system, like lots of companies have, you really have to be diligent about the, the challenges you take on because you can't just do it all. Uh, it's, there's no time or there's no resources. And so you have to be really focused on things that you decide to do, have a good justification for it, and then keeping that in mind so that you don't deviate and try to solve all the world's problems. 
Yeah, and like obviously there for some things there are guidelines, but there isn't like necessarily a specific rule to be able, there's not like here's this thing, follow all this and it'll be exactly what you need for every single person and have it work out. Yeah. So yeah, thank you all so much for doing this. I appreciate all the people who have come on both for speaking and for everyone who's been attending. Again, if you want to watch this later or if you haven't see, want to see any of the other ones, you can go to tanzu.tv and go through any things on Golden Path and you'll be able to see uh, videos for all the things, including this one immediately after this one stops streaming. So yeah, thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. And thank you. a few housekeeping things. So um, if you are wanting to learn more about Spring, which is probably like why you are attending this stream, for instance, um, there are other things as well, such as Spring Academy. Um, there are a bunch of different courses that you can go through and uh, learn more and follow, basically follow along for the people who want to do something specifically hands-on. We also, as I mentioned earlier in the stream, it, but in case you uh, missed it or whatnot, um, we are having Spring One. It is co-located this year with VMware Explorer in Vegas. Um, it's between August 21st and 24th. CFP is open until April 14th. Please submit something. Um, it'd be great having you all there. So yeah, thanks again, everyone. And there's another stream on Thursday. So go to that as well.